Uh, in uh, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter two. And in, in verse 10, Paul is describing his meeting with uh, Peter and, and the other apostles. And he comes back and he, and he reports this to those in Galatia. He says, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. You know, and brothers and sisters, we should remember the poor, poor in our world. Amen. Amen. If they should be in our minds, they should be on the lips of our prayers. We should consider the poor in our world. And we are blessed to be a part of a great organization called Hope Worldwide. Yeah. And uh, we've shown videos about it. And uh, many have participated in different things. And, and uh, this year, we're going to continue. Uh, we're going to join in the International Day of Giving on November the 12th. And uh, it's a day where we take up an offering for Hope Worldwide. And uh, they are a, a, an organization that goes around the world. They have orphanages, they have uh, leper colonies, they mm. uh, have disaster relief uh, response teams that are out right now working, uh, so many great things. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna have those who've gone and worked with Hope uh, this summer, we've got several go and work with Hope, but they're gonna come up and share their experiences. Uh, we're gonna have Sean Klein come and then Yvonne Adame, okay. David Louie, the High Ferrant and Clayton South Brandon Brazil. And so uh, at this, uh, let's have Sean come up. Let's be giving, let's encourage them as they share. Church, how are we doing this morning? Yeah. All right, so if you guys don't know me already, my name is Sean. I was meeting a couple of you before I actually took off, so I think Josh was one of them where I was like, hey, nice to meet you, and then I actually used out a couple weeks later. <laughs> <laughs> so today I get a chance to actually share my life, of uh, just my relationship with God with you guys today, and uh, one of the opportunities he actually provided me was actually going to Bolivia. And what I really want you guys to get from this is actually how you guys can actually use your profession to glorify God. Um, and that's what I feel like I really got from this experience. So a little bit about me is I'm actually a paramedic and I decided to take that job route because I felt like that was the best way that I could actually use my skills to help other people. Best way that I could serve God in that sense. And God was able to actually take that dream and actually run with it. And so last year I actually had an experience in Kenya where I went for two weeks over there, uh, stopped at a hospital over there. Um, and it was just a great time. Uh, but I also saw a vision of the actual need for medical attention to the people uh, who are actually desperately in need. And so from the Kenya experience, I started looking around and actually going through Hope and trying to find different medical brigades and other places that I could actually serve. And sure enough, instead of me uh, actually finding them, they actually found me, thanks to God. <laughs> uh, what it was was I was actually just looking around and I found a medical brigade in uh, Bolivia and I just so happened to send uh, a woman named Gwen an email down there to see if they had opportunities coming up for a medical brigade. And it just so happened that uh, they were actually looking for an EMT to go, go there and actually design an ambulance project for them. So, you know, I, and I was looking for a place to serve. So, you know, he fit the hole right there. And uh, God was able to make everything just work out perfectly in the sense of uh, he just opened the doors and closed the doors very quickly. I was pursuing, you know, a certain job route and closed the doors of that. I had family problems. He ended that and on a good result. Um, <clears throat> money, had a, you know, a good opportunity to uh, actually provide myself while I was over there. And he also provided three months of actually just being able to go over there and serve. And it was just an awesome experience as far as going over there. I expected myself to simply... Uh, simply just design an ambulance project and that was it, just talk to them, talk, you know, discuss through some things. But God was able to open up a lot more opportunities as far as I was actually working with a lot of the uh, government officials and stuff like that. And here I am being like a low end paramedic guy and I never saw myself as somebody who would actually, you know, be working with government officials, helping design an actual ambulance project through Hope. Uh, to actually help other people. I was actually working with the SWAT teams down there with the, you know, great teams and this and that. I, you know, I don't have enough time to explain the whole three months and all that. But God was able to take my skills and actually completely use it for a huge picture, a picture that I didn't even dream myself of being able to use. Um, so I just want to share a quick scripture with you guys. You don't have to worry about turning to it, but it's Colossians 3, 
verses uh, 23 to 24. And it says, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Right. From that, I got. I just want you guys to see. Like, I know a lot of you guys are in college and you're still trying to figure out what my, per, you know, what is my per profession going to be? What am I going to do uh, career-wise? And uh, yeah, I just want you guys to actually take that peek out and actually dream big. Because um, being from my level, I thought I was just going to be in an ambulance helping people, and I was able to do so much more. And I'm still dreaming big. And you know, if you guys dream big, God's going to open up those opportunities for you. So, like Sean said, my name is Ivana Dame, um, and I'm going to be sharing about my service with Hope uh, Worldwide Singles Corps and uh, HGW Christ. So, on the first day of our service with Hope, we visited a geriatric home. During our time there, uh, we spent time with the residents, passed out sweet bread, and they told us about their lives. Many shared that they ended up there because they had lost loved ones and had no one else to care for them. It broke my heart to think that some of these residents would die alone there. So it's no wonder that they would light up when we came to visit them. Yeah. Visiting them reminded me of how valuable time is because we don't have it for long here on earth. Most importantly, I learned that I need to give my time by sharing the love of Jesus Christ with those who are and feel alone in the world. Our second service project was spending time with families in a refugee camp in Kuro Saishev. A refugee recounted of her arrival to the camp with her husband and children. She told us that they had to evacuate their home immediately with only the clothes on their backs. When first arriving to the camp, living conditions were very difficult. In one building, there were 100 refugees sharing one bathroom. I will never be able to imagine and probably will never be able to have to experience what it's like to lose everything I own due to war. Spending time with these families challenged me to grow in my gratitude for what I have and always be ready to share those things with others. Yeah. For our final service project, we spent time at a therapy camp doing various activities with children from the war zone. These children were exposed to violence and death. Some were even orphaned. We organized crafts, dancing and learning activities for the children. Despite they, the suffering they have witnessed, they had so much love to give to us. They would greet us with joy and excitement. It amazed me to see their resilience through that trauma. I'm really grateful that God gives me the opportunity to serve. Through that service, I've come to firmly believe that God created us to be givers. Amen. Jesus showed me that if I let myself go for the sake of others, that has the power to bring about a tender heart of understanding, affection, connection, and a desire to give even more. Jesus continually shows me that there's a hurting world out there, and if I want to see things change for the better, then I need to do something about it. He taught me that every act of kindness, no matter how small, makes a big difference to the person it's directed at. God also reminded me that I shouldn't waste my time chasing after the material pleasures of this world because those things don't last. Yeah. But our love for others can continue into eternity. In 1 John 3.18, it says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Thanks for letting me share, guys. Um, next up is going to be David Louie. Howdy guys. Howdy. So I went to Indonesia for my youth corps uh, in June of this year. And it was cool, every youth corps kind of has a hashtag. So the, the capital city of Indonesia, Jakarta. And so our hashtag was Jakarta be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> and like how, how it happened was we were, we first came back from the airport, we were on our way to the campsite, we were pumped up. And I'm like, all right, we don't know what to expect, it's gonna be great. And literally right, like one of the first things we do is run over a cat. On the oh, highway, yeah. and just one guy, and one guy just goes, "Jakarta, be kidding me!" I'm like, "Yes, that's the hashtag," and that's how it happened. So it was just totally an unexpected time. It was awesome, uh, but one of the main things, uh, our areas of service that we did was we went to a little little tiny village called Chilinching, 
and it's about two hours south from Jakarta, which is the capital city. And I remember going there and just seeing extreme poverty, like like not just homeless shelters, not just not not, not just you know orphanages and all that, but extreme poverty. And what it was was that when when we entered the area, there was like it was basically a huge dump of waste and a huge like area of water, and it was all dirty water. And the only way to enter this village was they actually got a bunch of coke cans and a lot of trash, and they made a path for us. So we had to walk on trash, and we were just like, whoa, like, what's going on? So we walked, and we get there, and there it is. We enter this kind of little village, you know, that's hidden from the, from the city. And we go in, and it's just extreme poverty. You walk in there, and I mean, there's just so many people doing things that you just wouldn't imagine just to live for a couple of cents a day. And basically what, I, how I felt was what we did um, was we actually went to, we, Hope, the Hope, Hope of White actually like owns one of the buildings there. And so we have like a Saturday Academy. And what the church has been doing there for the past 12 years is that every Saturday without fail, they get a huge bunch of people to go there and just teach kids education. And they go through math, English, geography, Bahasa, which is the language there, and all these sort of things. And it's just great. Like they, they have one tiny school, but they don't have any school there. So all the kids from the entire village just come to that one tiny, tiny little building just to learn. And it's just, it was just so exciting to be there. But I remember talking with one of the kids, and he well, actually was a teenager, and his name was Ahmed. And we just talked, and, and I remember him asking me a lot of questions. I remember thinking, okay, I'm gonna have to be giving, I'm gonna have to ask him a lot of things and get to know him. But sure enough, he was actually asking me a lot of questions, getting to know me, and I was just like, okay. And then the question that really like got me frozen was when he asked, so what do you wanna do in life? And I went, you're asking me? I mean, I didn't say that, but in my heart I was like, Shouldn't I be asking that to you? You know, in, in the sense where, I, like when you ask it, you kind of have an answer on your own. And so for me, I was just so, I was surprised I didn't even know what to say because I was just so shocked. And it was just so sweet. I basically then after I went to like, kind of like the grief area and I just sat there and I honestly had a breakdown and I was just kind of on my own because I just realized that all of these kids here just, they don't have hope. They don't have any dreams, realistic dreams to look forward to, except just raising a family in a village and that's it. And so I was just, I just didn't know what to do because they were, all, what it is is that every, one in every six people in Indonesia is a radical Muslim. And so the entire village is Muslim. And so we're not allowed to share our faith out of respect, you know, which was obviously what we did. And so we, we obviously made sure we didn't do that. But where I lost my security was because I felt like, well, if I can't share my faith with them and I can't give them hope, then what do I offer them? I mean, all we did was paint their buildings and teach them, you know, how to calculate the area of triangles and things like that. Like, sure, they were great, but I thought, man, like, what is this really doing? Like, I can't give these guys hope. And so I just broke down. And one brother, I, I'll leave his name um, anonymous because of the sensitivity of his testimony. Uh, one of the local brothers approached me and talked to me. And long story short, he, he, we had a translator. He told me about his life. He saw me, I was emotional. He was like, what's up? So I told him all this and he told me that he actually grew up in this village when he was a kid. And I said, no way. And basically, he said that this church came, you know, for the past 10, 15 years, and it went as he was growing up. And he, and he watched them, and he was very observant. And finally, when he was old enough, his parents sent him as a quote-unquote spy. Because when, once they found out after a long time that we're part of a church as well, they said, we don't trust these guys. Go and be inside of their church and act as a spy and see what they're really about. And if you can, if you figure out that there that there's something wrong, go and expose it. And they were even plotting ways to actually destroy the church, and it was really intense. But this guy was like, okay, so he had his mission to go in the church. Sure enough, God is amazing. And in three weeks of secretly being a double agent in the church, he stuck the Bible in their back. Wow. <laughs> the spy turned around, and it's just it's amazing. And so he he told me why he share that with me was he said David like when when the people before you the past few years before you came and interacted with our village they didn't share their faith right. all they did was just love them yeah. Yeah. and that alone caused a spark in my faith yeah. he said that alone caused me to, to, to second guess myself yeah. and that alone made you guys stand out and because of because of, they were so loving I thought surely these guys are fake yeah. surely these guys aren't really who they say they are but they and it was because they had hope. And so I think that was my main takeaway. When I heard that, I was so moved to realize that we don't have to 
quote unquote, share our faith and bring people to church with giving hope. We just gotta love people. Yeah. Right. We just gotta show people God through our actions and our love. Yeah. And so that's just the one takeaway that I have that really inspired me, and I hope we can do the same. So yeah. now we're gonna have the hype block to share with you. Yeah. the Philadelphia Youth Corps um, this summer. And so one of the great things about HOPE is that um, the Youth Corps programs is that they not only uh, go outside of the U.S. to go help the poor, but they really strive to um, do their best to serve the poor inside the U.S. And so um, I got the opportunity to be a part of the program called Camp Miracles. And um, it was funny when they asked me to, <laughs> to lead this program, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll lead for the Youth Corps. I've done this several times. And then in our first conference call, they're like, okay, so this is a sports camp. So we're gonna, <laughs> so we're gonna be teaching these, it's like strength and conditioning for like these inner city kids. And I kind of just want to be like, excuse me. <laughs> like I get frustrated when I'm flipping through the channels and like there's sports channels. And I'm like, like, can we just get through the sports, please? Like, um, and so I was like sitting in these meetings and, and they were talking about all these different aspects of it. And I was like, yeah, I can't help you. Like I can organize things, but that's pretty much it. Um, but what was really cool is that we got, um, so we work with inner city kids in Philadelphia. I've worked with this program about six times. And so um, they take the kids out of the inner city and they bring them to camp for a week or two, um, which is really great because these kids don't ever have an opportunity to get out of the violence and danger of uh, the inner city. It's just, it's concrete everywhere. And um, generations after generations stay in these like super small like homes and they get into drugs and alcohol and just all this crazy stuff. Um, and so, but I've seen these kids throughout the past, you know, six years going there, changing their lives just by, you know, coming out to camp and hanging out and being with loving people. They've gotten to really, like, doors have really opened um, for them in their lives. And so uh, when we were having these conference calls, we were talking about um, having different coaches come out and train the kids because a lot of these kids, they have aspirations to be sports players and uh, athletes and all this stuff. And so it was really cool. We got um, Daniela Williams. She's uh, Serena and Venus Williams' niece, and she's an aspiring uh, tennis player. Um, so she came out and did a uh, tennis camp for the kids, um, which was really awesome. We got, um, so you know, Michael Jordan, when he got cut from his high school basketball team. Um, so the guy who he got cut, like, he got cut and the other guy got put on the team, his name's Jerry, and Jerry came out um, <laughs> and taught the kids basketball and um, and a lot of other like really great prominent like athletes <laughs> came out and taught these kids and, um, and they had an amazing time. The kids also got to um, go to the football stadium and um, this is some of them uh, and they like, blew out the whole place for us. They put on the screen, like, Welcome Camp Miracles. They gave the kids all this gear, and um, they got to meet players and stuff like that. It was just really cool to be able to, like, give these kids these opportunities. Um, and when we were talking about it, I was like, originally, I was like, guys, I don't I don't know if anyone's going to come out and do this. Like, this isn't, I don't know how much this is going to work. But um, it's crazy just the power of God and how he was able to just move and bring people from all around the U.S., like athletes, people who are, you know, getting training for their sports or training for all these things and, like, spending money. These, some of these people can spend thousands of dollars on these kids um, just so they can teach them for a week. Um, and it was cool just to be able to see some of the kids from the beginning, um, from, like, six years ago, who were just a mess and a disaster. And I was like, you, I'm so done with you. And, <laughs> but now, like, they're incredible and I saw some of these kids who, because we're not, you know, we're not there to, you know, shove the Bible down their throat. We're there to just love them and spend time with them. And if they want to learn about God, then we're there too also. And so there was one morning I was walking through the camp. Um, I was on a prayer walk with one of the girls. And I saw one of the Camp Miracles kids, one of the inner city kids, um, sitting there with his mentor uh, having a Bible study. And I, after I went, I was like, what's going on? And like, after I went to the guy, he was like, he just woke up and was like, hey, can we like open the Bible, can we talk about this? Like, I wanna know what you guys are about. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, it was really cool. And not because we, you know, did anything or we shoved the Bible down the throat, it's because God has so much power to move in people's hearts and move into their lives. And there was a girl who came 
Um, we had an anniversary for the camp, um, and there was a girl who came to uh, to visit, and she was one of my first mentees from the first year, and she actually got kicked out of camp that year because she was a mess, and I had no mentee for the rest of the week. Um, but she came, and now she's a part of the campus ministry. Um, she's doing great. She moved out and uh, has an amazing job and is an athlete and all this crazy stuff, and I just like, I just hugged her. I was like, "Oh my gosh! Like you've grown up so much. Like it's so it's so exciting to see that." And um, it just makes me think of Romans eight verse twenty eight. It says, "And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and who have been called according to His purpose." Like God works in amazing ways outside of the country and crazy countries that are here in the U.S. Like working for the better of people who love Him. And so it's just really encouraging to see. So thanks for letting me share. I'm gonna have Brandon, come up. Brandon. Hey, you guys. How y'all doing today? Um, so, yeah, I'm Brandon. Um, if you don't know me, I um, this past semester or this past summer in July, I spent two weeks in Haiti. And um, so, yeah, these are just a few pictures of the trip. Um, it was an amazing time. I was able to really just experience and, and learn just so many great things. Um, today, I just want to share like a particular story that just has a lot of meaning and really moved me a lot. Um, so we spent most of the time in, in South Haiti in Lakai, which is about four hours. It took us about six hours to get there, but from uh, Port-au-Prince. And so when we got there and we stayed there and we stayed at the orphanage with the kids. But two days during the two weeks, we went to St. Martin, which is about an hour away from Lakai. And we slept on the beach for two nights, and we, um, yeah, we we spent time there, and we served there. And we actually have we have a church in Lakai, but we actually have a little church in the village of Saint Martin as well. And so they, this this town, this this place, it's really destroyed. It's a beautiful beach, and it was a beautiful place, but like the town itself, it's been it's been really devastated by the earthquakes and by the hurricanes. And so like there's trees knocked down everywhere. A lot of these people don't have homes, and it was, it was crazy. We didn't have any electricity or anything. We just literally slept in tents on the beach and woke up and served. And it was amazing, okay? So the first night, we stayed two nights there. And the first night, we all got together on the beach. And we were all sitting in the sand. And uh, Will, actually, he, he made a big fire. And we were all sitting around a bonfire. Because uh, Will and Jory actually went too. They're from College Station. But uh, we, um, we had a big bonfire going. And we were worshiping under the stars. And you could see the Milky Way. Like, it was just beautiful. And uh, the group of disciples from this village, like they come up, came up and they joined us. And they started singing with us. They didn't even speak the same language, but they started singing with us. Like we were singing in English and they were singing in Creole and they were worshiping. And then they recited like two different Psalms, Psalm one and Psalm 23. They recited them all together in unison, uh -huh. like with like no notes or no Bible or anything. <laughs> and it was just so cool, like because I saw that and I just saw how much love and how happy they were. And I don't know a lot of, what I used to think, if it's if it's similar to what you think, when you think of Haiti, you don't think about the most desirable place, right? I mean, you just know that it's poverty struck and and it's a third world country. And I mean, going there and seeing it, that's a lot of that. It lines up with it. It's it's a really sad and it's really poor, and it, it really broke my heart in a lot of places. But seeing the love and and the joy on the on the in the people there and of the people all throughout Haiti and the disciples that we have out there, it really just just made me think, like, and it opened up my eyes. Because these people have so little, and they're just so happy, and they rely on God, and they're able to just be happy, you know, despite the circumstances, and despite anything they go through, what they've been through, they're able to be happy and, and lean on God and still have that joy. And I don't know, it really opened up my eyes. There's a scripture that, that um, you don't have to turn there, but it's Philippians 4, 12 and 13. It says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yeah. strength. And through these disciples and through all the, the orphans that we were spending so much time with, I saw that, that they got strength from God and they were happy because of that. Yeah. And I think the main lesson that I took away was like, I'm here in the United States and I'm so fortunate and I, I could just go to go to university, Texas A&M University and I get to have all of these different blessings and sometimes I can be more stressed out and more just just frustrated over life than these people are who have nothing. Wow. And it really moved me. 
But uh, but yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, that's basically all I'm sharing. I do have one picture I'd like to show. Um, so Will, he was on the trip and he got really close to a kid and it was just amazing. Will he has he has a heart to serve and and he really moved me just seeing him on that trip. And so this is him and what's his kid. That's uh, Will and Wrigley John. But, uh, but that's all I got. So thank y'all for letting me Thank you so much to everyone that, that, that shared today. Uh, you know, the, the greatest thing about helping the poor is that you get more than you give. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, as we hear these stories today, I definitely hope it, it warms your heart and reminds you of the reality of our world, that people are suffering, people are hurting. Um, we often struggle with first world problems of no Wi-Fi and the AC is not getting cold. And there's just so much, there's such a bigger world that needs our help. Yeah. And right. so thank you so much for going. Thank you for what you shared. Uh, let's give it up for these guys. Amen. Yeah.